And now, Mystery Theater. E.G. Marshall. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. A quote, naturally, and almost as naturally from Shakespeare. On the other hand, like Proverbs, quotes tend to contradict themselves. It was Oliver Goldsmith who said, Conscience is a coward, and those faults it has not strength enough to prevent, it seldom has justice enough to accuse. That contradiction is what this story is all about. What are you doing in that closet? Oh, why, Aunt Hester, I was just trying to make myself at home. Never I... poke your nose into anything in this house that isn't your business. I didn't mean to. What's that you have in your hand? It's so queer. All leather and steel and buckles and things. I don't know what it is. Nor is it your business to. While you stay here, don't you ever meddle with anything that doesn't belong to you. That's the first and last thing you have to learn about Malvern Grange. Our mystery drama, Afraid to Live, Afraid to Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jada Rowland and Anne Petoniak. She's an old lady now, and an old friend in my family, and she is a remarkable woman. She's more sedentary than in past years, since she's in her nineties, but she is still slim, and her white hair frames a shrewd and kindly face. She never married, and for most of her years was a baby nurse. Only the last quarter of her life has she taken to being companion to other elderly and lonesome ladies except for one other time near the beginning of her life. And this is Ellen Muir's story about that haunting and terrifying experience. Even young as I was then, I had this strange feeling about Malvern Grange. When I first saw it, dark and shadowed at the end of the long drive, lined by the great shade trees that made an eerie black tunnel on that otherwise bright moonlit night. It was the very picture of the haunted house. And fat, wheezy old Joe Wellman driving me by trap from the railroad station didn't help me to feel much easier in my mind. Well, hello there, Missy. I reckon you'd be Hester Milgram's niece she's expecting. Yes, sir. Ellen Muir, right? That's me. I'm Joe Wellman. Pleased to meet you. Jack of all trades. Gardener, groom, handyman, and general bodyguard to all them lonesome women out to the Grange. This, uh, all the luggage you got? Yes, sir. Oh, oh, no, I can carry it. Oh, I bless you, little one. Ain't no way to tall, even for an old geezer like me. Now, come on. I got a horse and trap waiting to drive you off to the Grange. Yes, sir, you sure don't take after Hester. You're a right pretty little thing. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? Oh, no, sir. I didn't say anything out of line, did I? It wasn't that. I I just didn't know what to answer. Ellen, I want you to meet Jenny. She's a filly, just like yourself. <laughs> Hello, Jenny. <laughs> oh, what a soft nose she has. All right, there. Your bag's aboard. It's getting on to twilight, and we'd best be on the way. It's a long drive, so up you go. <laughs> Did you get anything to eat on the way down the train? Oh, no, sir. Oh, wasn't it a dining car? Oh, yes, Mr. Wellman, but I didn't have enough money. To... Well, right beside you on the seat, there's a, a bag of apples there. Hey! Oh, Jenny. I don't want to take your apples. Oh, bless you, little miss. I brought you those from the Golden Lion, where I was having a pint while, while waiting for the train. So just fire away. Well, that was very kind of you. 
To tell you the truth, I am powerful hungry. Well, those will keep you going till you get to the Grange. Only don't fill up all the way, because I know your Aunt Hester has tea and a currant cake all waiting for you time you get old. <laughs> now, what does she say wrong? Nothing wrong. Just... Home. That was it, wasn't it? Huh? You're homesick. Kind of. I've never been away. Away from home. Eh, not much of a one you're coming to with that. What do you mean? Well, it's a gloomy old place for a bright young lady like you, stuck off in nowhere with a bunch of old clucking hands and, and her. My aunt's very nice. She came to see us once. Oh, I, Miss Milgram's all right if you don't cross her. Her heart may be kind enough, but a word is short and her word is law. And don't you ever forget it. You mentioned her. Who is... is her? Oh, well, no. That's uh, something else again. You've only to watch her and see she's possessed by old Nick himself. She's more than a half a ghost. Ghost? A ghost, yes, sir. She's near a hundred, you know. All wizened up and wrinkled like a witch with long, pointy nails and hands that are all skin and bone. You mean the madam? Madam Lytton? Who else? Lord knows how she's lived this long. But the good Lord also knows we all hope and pray she'll live to be 150. <laughs> Our jobs depend on it. When she goes, we go. And so does Malvern Grange. But... Well, there's a grandson. Doesn't he live there? Dr. Lytton. Sakes alive. No, he can't abide the place. He lives and practices in the city. Ah, now, here it is dark enough for the moon to be the only light in me scaring the living daylights out of you. I'm sorry. Oh, that... That's all right, Mr. Wilmer. I didn't mean to, Miss Muir. I just wanted to prepare you for your visit. Well, this isn't a visit. I've come here to work. A little thing like you? I'm strong. And I can cook and clean as good as any. And things haven't been so good with my pa. My sister Becky is old enough now to help Ma out with the six young ones. And also, I had to hire out. And my aunt needed help. That's why I'm here. <laughs> well, I see you can talk up well enough when you're of a mind to. Well, mainly when I'm nervous, sort of. And it does sound a bit scary. Well... We won't talk on it anymore. No, I must say, it is a queer household, right enough. Is it much further? Nope, we're almost there. What's the house like? Oh, why, bless you, it's a great black and white house it is with... Black beams running up and down and across and the gables looking out white as a sheet. And except like now when the moon is out and it throws the shadows of the trees on them and you can count the leaves, shadows dancing in the wind across the stucco till they look like, like crabs scuttling across the sand. Oh. Only upsy-downsy like, you know. Oh. But uh, here, here, you might see for yourself. Here's the drive. My heart was in my mouth as we drove up the drive. The trees were so big that four people spreading their arms and touching fingers could scarce reach round. And it was like a long, great black tunnel there beneath them, with the big house crouching at the end as huge as a giant or an ogre in some old fairy tale. I wanted to jump out and run away just as fast as my legs would carry me. Oh, here you are at last, Ellen. I'm sorry if I'm late, Aunt Hester. Well, you're not late, child. It's just been an anxious wait. You've come a long journey. Joe, take the bag up to the first room by the head of the stairs. Yes, Miss Milgram. See you tomorrow, little missy. Oh, yes, Mr. Wilman, and, and thanks for the ride and, and oh, the conversation. Pleasure, I'm sure. He is a hired man, Ellen. Call him Joe. We must all keep our place around here. But, Aunt Hester... Do as I say. Now, first... Welcome to Malvern Grange. Thank you. Well, come. We'll go up to my room for a moment and let you freshen up. And then we'll go into the housekeeper's salon where 
Meg will have something for you to eat. You'll be hungry, I expect. Oh, not too. Mr. Well... Uh, Joe gave me some apples on the way. And what else did he give you on the way? And earful about all of us, I'll warrant. Oh, just about Mrs. O'Meara and... Uh, well, I, I don't know whether she, she is a miss or a missus. He just called her Judith Squires. Mrs. O'Meara will be Meg to you. She's a servant. But, Auntie, so am I. You are my niece, and I am the housekeeper. As I said, everything in its place. Since you are young, they can call you by your first name. And the other lady? Judith? Oh, well, she's far on in years. You may call her Miss Squires. Uh, this is my bedroom. I'll put the candle over here. And while you take off your coat and hat, I'll just put a taper to the overhead lamp so we can see a little better. There we are. Now then. Yes, ma'am. Aunt. Yes, Aunt. What did Joe tell you about the madam? You mean the old lady who's sick? M Mrs. Lytton? That's who I mean. The madam. Why, he... Well, Don't well, lie he... to me, girl. No, ma'am. I, 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 no, I mean no, Aunt Hester. He, he just said I shouldn't tell anyone. Well, I'm sure he did. Tell me what nonsense he might have been filling your head with. Oh, it is nonsense, isn't it? I mean, she isn't possessed by the... the devil. And, and she's not half a ghost, is she, Aunt Hester? I knew it. The answer to you, Ellen, is that the madam is none of your business. She's a very old lady, and she's not in the best of health. Now, that's all you ever need to know of her. You're not here to take care of her. You're here to do housework that the rest of us haven't time for. Now, that's the end of that. Come. We'll go into my dining sitting room and you can meet Meg and get something to eat. Where's Mrs. Squires? She's upstairs sitting with the madam. Is that Judith falling asleep again? You'll find Meg through that door. I have to go upstairs to the madam. In a second, my aunt was hurrying up the stairs. One black mittened hand shielding the candle flame from blowing out in the rush. And as the dark closed around me, I hurried for the door she had pointed out to me while I could still see it. The room I entered was all paneled in oak. A fine fire blazing away. Plenty of light and tea and hot cakes and meat smoking away on the table. And there was Meg, fat and jolly, big as a house. Well, and here's our new companion at last. Ah, a pretty little thing that'll put a bit of light in this gloomy old house, maybe. <laughs> You'll be Ellen. Well, I'm Meg O'Meara. Pleased to meet you, Mrs. O'Meara. No, oh, no, let's make it Meg the morning. For though I've a year or twenty on you, we're the only ones in this house with the juice of youth still bubbling in our veins. Oh, thank you. Oh, me darling, you must be hungry. Sit down, then, and eat. Oh, where's Miss Milgram? Something happened upstairs. Oh? There was someone with a, I don't know, a weird sort of laugh. And Aunt Hester went running upstairs. That'll be the madam. Oh, Lord preserve us. I suppose Judith fell asleep again. Oh, and if the old one got away, well, oh, well, never mind. Your aunt will take care of it. Oh, sit you down, darling, and start eating and forget the other while you can. <laughs> So far, certainly a haunting experience. The terror is yet to come, and eventually, the matter of conscience. Let us leave poor little Ellen to her delicious meal, for Peg O'Meara's cooking is as good as her heart, and return shortly to that haunting gabled house. It's fascinating to sit and watch Ellen Muir tell her story today, calmly and sadly, looking back over 70 years to when it happened. It is easy to understand how vividly she remembers the young girl who lived it, the Ellen Muir who sat in that haunted house, homesick and hungry, and in spite of her jolly companion Meg, 
still filled with an inescapable premonition of a terror yet to be faced. You'll have some more cake, Ellen. And a spot more tea. Oh, no, thank you, Meg. I'm so full I couldn't even manage another crumb. Oh. Thank you. I wonder what's keeping Aunt Hester so long. Well, I, I'm thinking it's Judith's getting the tongue lashing this time. She probably fell fast asleep like she's apt to do. And the old madam was off and away. But I thought she was bedridden. Well, no, she is and she isn't. Days will go by and she won't open the curtains on that old four poster she sleeps in. Just stays shot up in there, except for us bringing her meals. But the other days... But the other days what? Well, the other day she's a troublesome old lady, no doubt of that. You have to be sharp watching her, or glory be to Mary, she'll be into the fire or out the window. How old is she? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't believe it. Ninety-nine, her last birthday. And that, eight months gone by... Could I ask another question, Meg? Ask away. What's the harm? It is not to say I'll answer. Is the old lady well in health? Well, no harm in, in asking that. She's... Well, she's been a bit off for a bit lately. But she's much better this last week. I dare say she'll last out her hundred years or more yet. Oh, oh wish here comes your aunt down the hall. I couldn't tell much from my aunt's face when she came in. It was calm, and she didn't seem put out. But she drew Meg aside and started to talk with her. In the warm room with company and good food in my stomach, I felt more at home and started to look about. There were pictures on the wall, and pretty old china things in the cupboard. And there was a door open in the wainscot. And inside, a closet, I saw this queer thing hanging up inside. I was just going to look at it when... What are you doing in that closet? Oh, I've asked her. I was just trying to make myself at Never home. Never I... poke your nose into anything in this house that isn't your business. I didn't mean what to. What's that I... you have in your hand? It's so queer. All leather and steel and buckles and things. I don't know what it is. Nor is it your business to. While you stay here, don't you ever meddle with anything that doesn't belong to you. That's the first and last thing you have to learn about Malvern Grange. Now give it to me. Oh, Mrs. Milgram, the child meant no harm. Well, it's better that she learns to mind her P's and Q's. I don't want any repetitions of... She's my niece, Meg. I want her protected. My aunt took me up to my bed and settled me in for the night. My only instructions were that since my room was next to the madam's, I was to be ready to call if need be, and 6.30 was rising time. I lay for a while awake, nervous-like. I think it was all the tea in me, and the thought of the picture Joe Wellman had given me, the strange old lady next door. Next morning, I slept late. And by the time I got down for breakfast, my aunt and the local doctor were upstairs with the madam. And Meg and I were alone in the kitchen. Oh, there you are, little Ellen. Country fresh scrambled eggs. Now you eat them all up. You look a bit pale. Did you sleep well? I, I slept sound enough. I'm ashamed I'm up so late. Well, I'll show you that your aunt's not all pepper and vinegar. She's the one who said you shouldn't be disturbed till you rested up from your trip. Now, eat your eggs. I'll get you some tea. Oh, if you don't mind, I'd rather have milk. Well, and so... You should be, darling, to bring the roses back to those pale little cheeks. You know, you don't look like you slept so well. Well, my room is next to Mrs... Well, you know, the madam. And I... I thought there was a, quite a lot of coming and going, the way it sounded. Oh, sure. And the old bell dam has been in one of her tantrums from the night before you arrived till today. She takes fits of the sulks, do you see? Sometimes she won't let us dress her, and other times she won't allow us to take the clothes off of her. Oh, and Lord of mercy, Ellen Child, you should see the closet after closet she has full of old-fashioned stuff. And she still likes to wear them? Oh, Lord above us, sometimes we can't get her out of them till the doctor comes. Like today. You mean she goes to bed wearing them? 
ball dresses, evening clothes, and sometimes even a sable or an ermine stole. Now, oh, what am I telling you this for, love? Tis none of your business. She's an old lady, living well past her time, for some reason God only knows. She was a great beauty in her day, so they say. And proud. Will I get to see her ever, do you think? Well, I don't know, darling. Just as well, you shouldn't. I would have liked to have seen the old lady. But she might as well have been up in the city for all the close I got. I did my cleaning and my needlework. And once or twice a week, the town doctor came in to check the madam. Nights, after my dinner, before the twilight, my aunt made me go out to get some air in the gardens. I was always glad when I came back. The trees were so big, and the place so dark and lonesome. It always made me cry and think of home. Usually, I'd go down to the stable and try to find Joe. Sometimes we we could talk. It's none of my business, Miss Muir, but why don't you go on back home? This is no place for a nice, fresh little girl like you. My aunt is very kind, and Meg is fun. And I told you my pa isn't doing so well. It's important I have my job here. I can't let my ma and pa down. Or my aunt. And it's not so bad here with you and Meg. And Aunt Hester. And as it works out, I seldom see Mrs. Squires. And never the madam herself. Well, that's all to the good so far. But there's something evil lies on this house and this family. And I wouldn't want it ever to touch you. I'm not so young as I apparently seem, Joe. I can take care of myself. In spite of all my tremors and silly fears, I meant that when I said it to Joe. My life was very simple, actually. I did the laundry, some cleaning, and sometimes I sat in the great chamber in which the madam slept, the curtains drawn around the bed, tending but for all intents and purposes, might have been a corpse. Till one evening, when I was in my own room reading, my aunt was in the next room with the madam, and of a sudden, I could hear them talking. I pricked up my ears, but it was nothing but a mumble, till I stole ever so quiet to my own door, and opened it a crack to listen. Then I could hear the old lady speak at last. A queer, high voice, like a bird. I, I don't know how to describe it. But for all it cracked and trembled, it was clear enough. I'm not going to die. Never going to die. He can't have me. I won't let him. <laughs> oh, don't let the devil have me. He'll hurt me. The evil one can't hurt anyone, ma'am, without the Lord permit. Oh, now, now, hush, 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 now, don't get yourself worked up. They're all against me, but they lie. They tell lies, you see, and they're jealous. Envy, envy, envy because I'm beautiful. So they lie. And he believes them, maybe. Believes them about what? That's Let them pull all the faces they want, ma'am, and say what they will. Just remember, if the Lord is for us, who can be against oh, us? I love him so, do you see? I couldn't bear to share him. But now he's dead. Dead. Dead and gone. Oh, dead and gone. I kept listening with my ear to the door a long time. Not another word did I hear. So finally, I closed it quietly and went back to my picture book. Till suddenly... Oh! Will you oh. wake her again after the oh. trouble I've had getting her to sleep? The madam? Well, who else? 
all dressed up like she was off to the inauguration ball. Not even her wig or her slippers would she take off. Oh, I am exhausted. Now, listen to me. Move your candle and your book over to your door and keep it open so you can watch and listen. I've left Madame Lytton's door ajar. And I'm off to have a cup of tea and a bite. And when Judith and I come back up, you can go down and Meg will give you supper in my room. But if you hear her stir, mind, give me a call. Pull shut her door and hang on to the handle as if for dear life till I and the others come up to help. I sat there trying to keep my eyes on the book, but they kept being drawn down the shadowed hall to the other door. I couldn't hold it back. I had to have one peep just to see what the old lady was like. I was near blinded the moment I entered the room. I'd never been in it after dark before, and it was ablaze with 22 wax candles. I tiptoed to the bed and listened. I could hear her breathing, rusty-like, the kind of gurgle. And slowly, slowly I parted the curtain and looked in. There she was, just lying as Meg described her that first day. Scarlet and green and satin and silk and lace. A big powdered wig. Heels as tall as my hand. And as sharp as her big crooked nose and her long, pointy nails. Half of the whites of her eyes were open. Her throat rattled as she breathed. I was frozen stiff with fright. And before I knew it, she opened her eyes and sat up. Spun around and dropped her shoes to the ground with a clack. She stood up, pointing at me with a finger. Like a corpse coming to life. You, 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 oh, young imp. You, devil's brat. Why did you say it to my face? Say, say, say what, madam? Why did you say I killed the boy? What, what boy? You know. You know. Tell me or I'll shake the life out of you. I'll rake you with my nails to the black line. I'll spoil your beauty. No. Oh. Stop backing away. I have you in a corner. Well, tell me. Why did you say I killed the boy? I, I never, I never said You lied! of terror has arrived. Ellen, backed into a corner of the room, faces the demoniacal old bell dame who advances on her, mad yellow-white eyes rolling in her head, her ancient wrinkled hands with the nails mounted on the fingers like knives reaching for her face and her throat. I'll return shortly with Act Three. A story in three stages. First, haunting. Second, replete with terror. Both of these shall continue. But last, and far from least, the matter of conscience. The complex of ethical and moral principles which controls or inhibits the actions and thoughts of an individual. We begin now, certainly, with Ellen's conscience which was bothering her quite as much as her memory of terror. Now that she was safely down in the sitting room with Meg, while Mrs. Squires and her aunt were upstairs greeting the madam. Now drink your tea, Ellen. I put a wee drop of brandy in it to calm you down, dear. Oh, I'm really all right now, Meg. I just lost my head a little. It wasn't that I couldn't have handled her physically. It, it was just... I was so scared. Oh, sure. Sure, she's enough to scare the devil when she gets into one of her fits. I'm sorry I wasn't strong enough to fight away being curious. Well, this time curiosity didn't kill the cat. And I'm a mite curious myself for all that. 
Well, why? Would you say those words again the old lady said to you? Oh, she... She said, why do you say I killed the boy? And did you say she killed the boy? But I, Meg, why would I say a thing like that? Oh, just a curious thing, love. That doesn't matter. Come on now, we'd, we'd best see you off to bed. That oh. drop of brandy will give you a nice, quiet sleep. I can see your eyes beginning to droop already. <laughs> there, Jenny, my love. Nothing like a nice bath and a good rub down, but what ails you, eh? <laughs> oh, hello there, little missy. Haven't seen you since all the excitement a day or so gone. How are you, Miss Muir? Oh, Joe, when we're alone, can it be just Ellen? Oh, I don't know. Might get me in trouble with Miss Milgram. <laughs> That'd make two of us. Well, she'll come around. She's a good woman at heart, and she knows there isn't a single solitary person in the world without a bump of curiosity. Yes, I know Aunt Hester's only strict and not unkind. The trouble is... Trouble is what? The trouble is, I'm still suffering from that bump. <laughs> Curiosity, huh? Uh-huh. What boy? Uh, well, that's an old story, Missy. But if you want to hear it, I'll tell it as sure as I can. Now, mind, this is only secondhand from my father, who was groomed here before me, and it's 70 years ago. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to, Joe. Ah, uh, Miss... Uh, I mean... Helen, what's the point not? Maybe it'll help you feel better, and that's all the reward I'd want. The madam, Mrs. Lytton, oh, she was a great beauty in her day, tell me. But when she married the owner of Malvern Grange, he was a widow, and he, he had a son about nine years old. Is that the boy she was talking about? Well, I suppose... Well, why would she think she killed him? Oh, that was a terrible tragedy, little Miss Ellen. The boy from what I hear was a fine young man, full of energy and daring. There are those who say he was allowed too much liberty because one day he just plain disappeared. And the hiding ahead of him was seen from that day forward. Save only his hat found by the lake under a hawthorn bush. But where do they think he went? What happened to him? Well, his little boat was missing, so he must have drowned. Oh, how awful. My pa said that Mr. Lytton bore up under it, but the madam went to pieces for a long while. But she must have had children then, if... Oh, yes, after she got over the loss, she had a boy, Mr. Stanley, that was, who was the father of Dr. Edmund. Mr. Stanley died a few years ago... So the estate now belongs to Dr. Edmund, the old lady's grandson. To have spent all those years worrying about something she couldn't help. And now to have it all back up at the end. Huh? Well, what are you talking about, Ellen? Oh, I was just thinking. I know it's a good thing we all have a conscience, but it can be a terrible thing, too. Poor Madame Lytton. Must be just as conscience-stricken at what she might have done as I am at what I shouldn't have. What's that? Well, she probably blames herself for not watching the little boy more closely. Just as I blame myself for trying to watch something closely that was none of my business. Oh, now, well, I'm a young girl, curious. You weren't to blame. No more than the madam, I guess. But try to tell your conscience that. But my conscience was not to be easily set at rest. I found out only too soon. Now, Ellen, will you stop your moping? Oh, how can I? Ever since the doctor came and I found out what that... that contraption hanging on the door was for. Oh, bless your child. It's not the first time she's been in the straight waistcoat. She's been in it many a time when she became violent. But does she have to be shut up in it? Well, the doctor's afraid she'll take another fit of madness as she's done before. But it's all my fault. Oh! How could it be your fault? Because I did something I shouldn't have. Oh, dear Mary in heaven, if we all lived our lives without doing some little thing we shouldn't have, oh, we'd all be in the same leather jerkins. Well, it's on my conscience. Well, me darling, I wish you only one thing. What? That that should be the heaviest thing you ever bear on your conscience. 
Meg's words made me feel better. Till the end came. A wild, terrible end. The screaming and the begging for no one knew what. And at long last, the soul made its flitting from her body, and she was at rest. Dr. Lytton was written for, but he was off in France on a vacation. And the delay would be so long that the local doctor agreed she could not be kept in her place. And the old lady of Malvern Grange was laid away to rest in the church where her ancestors were buried. While we all waited for Dr. Lytton's return, they moved me from my room, away from the old ladies, to one by the end of the hall. There was little in the room, but a bed and a big bureau. So a few things were moved in from the madam's room, which had been stripped when she was coffined. Among them, the big looking glass she used to dress up in front of and admire herself in her finery. The night after I moved there, that's where she came from in the middle of the night. The great key in her hand. Her eyes fixed on the alcove in the wall at the foot of my bed. With a blast of cold air, and I could see everything through her. The nightstand, the window frame, the pattern on the wall. Straight for the big bureau in the alcove she went, key outstretched. And as she vanished, I came alive and screamed as I've never screamed in my life. All right, Ellen, all right. It's all right I'm now. Sorry. I'm sorry, Aunt Esther. Oh, maybe it was a dream. Shh, but I... Shh, shh. Oh. Now, now, just tell me. Had the, the appearance that you saw a key in its hand? Oh, yes. Was it like this one? Why, well, that's it. The very image. Are you sure? As sure, as sure. Well, that'll do, child. You sleep here with me tonight. And the doctor will be here by noon tomorrow. I'm sorry for what I've put you through. The doctor arrived promptly at noon the following day. And after a half an hour or so, closeted with my aunt in the housekeeper's room, I was called in and introduced. Now, um, what is this you say you saw, my dear? It, it was your grandmother, Dr. Lytton. Well, you know my grandmother has been dead for nearly a month. It was her. I mean, not alive, but a, a ghost. You believe in ghosts? I never did, sir, but I believe in this one. I could see right through her. And you say that she just walked into the big high bureau and disappeared? With a key in her hand. This key? Or, or its copy. Hold on a minute. You mean... The, the room at the end of that hall to the left, up the stairs? Yes. And the bureau, you say, is in the alcove? Yes. Come on. We're going up there and bring that key. All right, now, ladies, if you'll assist me. And don't try to lift, just slide it. You ready? There. Oh, easy. Oh, easy. That, that, that's far enough. Now. What is it, Dr. Lytton? Uh, when I was a boy, oh, 25 years ago, an old servant we had told me there used to be a door here. By heaven, there it is. The uh, plate and jewels used to be kept here before the big pantry was built. Uh, give me that key. By Lord Harry, the lock turned. All right, now. Stand back, both of you, but hold that candle high. Here goes... Good Lord. What fell from the door as it opened was a small skeleton, its hand resting on the inside of the door, as if in a last plea for mercy. And as it fell to the floor, it all crumbled to dust, save for the small skull, which bounced and then rolled to my aunt's feet. That's all that was left 
from what had been shut up there all those years. Except some jet buttons and a small green hafted knife. The, the boy. He wasn't drowned. He was shut up here to die. Oh, no. My, my grandmother her, couldn't have... It's her rich family. She wanted it all for her own child. I damn myself for every minute of service I gave no, her. You, you can't be sure. You... When the boy disappeared, he was wearing a, a velvet suit with black jet buttons. You see? And his favorite possession was a green hafted knife. A knife from his father. But I, I and can't... the key, the key Ellen saw the ghost carry, I found at the bottom of your grandmother's chest, beneath her wigs and gloves and jewels and silks and satins, under which she tried to hide her guilt. Well, it served her little at the last. She's where she feared she'd be in the end, with the black devil, in the deeps of hell, where she belongs. Madame Lytton was afraid to die and equally afraid to live. For what a hell her later years must have become when ambition, desire, and greediness, like other emotions, are no longer strong and driving. Certainly no longer strong enough to still the pangs of conscience. I'll be back shortly. I find it hard nowadays to pass any neglected object by the water's edge without having to repress a shudder, a beer can, a pair of sunglasses, a sneaker, a child's pail, or most of all, a hat. For the moment I spot the object, I don't see it, but a poor little boy shut up to die in a sealed safe where neither his cries nor his wild thumpings on the door or his prayers, if he knew how to say them, could be heard. Our cast included Jada Rowland, Ann Petoniak, Joan Shea, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams? <laughs>